This is CBC Here and Now. Liquid and water in. We're doing good, aren't we, buddy? Wiretapped conversations played at the Al Potter murder trial. And details on how much money a police informant was paid while still collecting social assistance checks. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Anthony Germain. The drama surrounding the first degree murder trial playing out in the St. John's courtroom. That's our top story tonight. Al Potter had no idea he was being recorded or if he did, he certainly didn't sound like it. Wiretapped phone calls were played for the jury at Potter's first degree murder trial today. Ariana Kellen is covering the trial for Here and Now and she joins us live from our newsroom. So Ariana, what are we learning from these calls? Well, Anthony, there was happiness, laughter, and enthusiasm for the future. Just two buddies having a chat about their new job. Of course, that was all fake. And at this point, the RCMP was inching closer to arresting Al Potter for a murder in North River two years earlier. This is Bell Canada. You have a collect call from... Alan. You may press 1 now to accept the... Thank you. Hey, brother, how are you? It's September 2016. Al Potter and his fellow Vikings Motorcycle Club member speak many times a week. Potter in jail in Ontario, the man whose voice we've disguised in St. John's. That part is true. This next part of the conversation is not, but Al Potter most certainly believes it is. No, he just got some small little thing. He needs me to help him lift just some heavy lifting or something. He only needs a man for a little bit, but he said he might as well use me. We're all going to be working with the company. The company debt collecting was fictitious. That heavy lifting, according to the Crown, was in reference to moving a body. Potter had been paid a visit in jail by an undercover RCMP officer posing as the owner of a debt collecting business. Potter trusted who he was because he came recommended by that Viking club member who also happened to be working secretly with police. It's putting oh, you up the ladder, isn't it? I, I, oh my God, like we're going to go up it together, brother. Like we're going up the ladder oh, together. Dear. But I'm, but I'm going to do a fucking, I'm going to do a work when uh, this job he gives me, I'm going to do it to a T. Imagine oh, how good God. that's going to make you look when I come when I shines like a fucking shining star, and I'll and you're the one that and, and you're the one that got him to hire me. And for the Viking turned police agent's part, well, he deserves an Academy Award. There's nothing to top that. Nothing. Right? I can't think of anything. But one lottery wouldn't be the same. I'm real. Yeah, I'm real. Like when the water in. We're doing good, aren't we, buddy? No, he didn't win the lottery, but this 64-year-old police agent did get paid. In court this morning, it was revealed he was paid $300,000 to get information on Dale Porter's homicide and the Vikings, plus another $15,000 after the takedown, and then $800 every week for about two years. Tax-free, cold, hard cash. And all the while, he was still collecting social assistance. You'll get some credit for this. You just oh wait and see. Dear. Now, credit he got, not for getting Al Potter a job, but for putting him behind bars. Now, the defense says it was never explicitly clear on these calls what that job was. But the agent says there was no doubt that Potter knew he was being hired as a hitman and as a debt collector. Undercover police officers who conducted this sting are expected to take the stand next week. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Arianna Kelland. Well, there needs to be more incentive for Innu speakers to work as interpreters in the provincial court system. That's the message tonight from the justice coordinator of the Sheshashi Innu First Nation. David Panashue says the amount of money they're receiving from the provincial government to keep the positions filled just isn't enough. Jacob Barker has that story. Someone interested in working as an Innu interpreter in Labrador courts has two options. Take a permanent job and get $40,000 a year without payment for travel or food and be subject to a strict background check or get paid $45 an hour, have their meals and travel covered 
and face no background check whatsoever. We try to try our best to uh, get some workers up there, you know, to, to do the translating stuff. And we have bacon on that, that position for a long time now. For more than a year now, they've been trying to fill the interpreter role with no luck. We have some people that tried to uh, apply for it, but they did have a hard time because they, they got to pay their babysitter. Often delays happen because of availability or in one case, lack of familiarity with a certain dialect of Inuit Moon. I know the, the court, they, they're frustrated also in this, in this, in this situation. But the issue with Inu justice position stretches beyond the courthouse. While the province says it provides $55,000 for each Inu position, Panashwe says some of that money is used for administration costs. He says the salary levels for the interpreters, victims, services, and parole officers haven't changed since 2008 when the positions were started as a pilot project. The band wants the pay increase to 70 or $80,000 a year. We told the province we need some help here and uh, they need to do something. There has been no training program for interpreters since 2008. The provincial government says they're in talks with the College of the North Atlantic to get one up and running this year. Because we need more good uh, translators so that they can translate the, the way the court want to be translated. Panashwe says the Sheshashi Inu First Nation has also been asking to bring a circuit court back to the community since 2013, a decision the Department of Justice says is in the hands of the chief judge. We're trying our best to, to bring the court back to our community. You know, we, we, we have a um, building. Well, the provincial government acknowledges that there are challenges finding interpreters for specific languages and that during times of fiscal restraint, the department is trying to work within already allocated budgets. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Well, it's no April Fool's prank. Minimum wage is set to go up on April the 1st. The government announced today that it's going to increase it to $11.40 an hour. That's up from $11.15. And the minimum wage overtime rate, that will be set at $17.10 per hour, up from $16.73. Provincial government says this is the second annual increase based on the percentage change in the National Consumer Price Index, that formula-based approach. So well, that was brought in last year. It's Colleen Connors here live in Cornerbrook at the start of the Cornerbrook Winter Carnival. Tonight marks the beginning of 10 days of fun in this West Coast city, and we'll bring it all to you. That's coming up. Well, if you're planning on any activities like the festival this weekend, uh, you're in for a little bit of a roller coaster as far as temperatures go. Uh, right now, we saw, or this afternoon rather, we saw plenty of sunshine across the province. Temperatures as your daytime high sitting between 0 and minus 2 or minus 3 uh, up through Labrador, even uh, nice and warm up through Happy Valley Goose Bay, plenty of sunshine and minus 7. Now, we are starting to see some cloud cover move in thanks to the next system that's making its way in. We'll continue to see that cloud cover move further north through the night tonight. Some snow will move in for Labrador and then we're going to see a mess as we head through the day tomorrow for most of Newfoundland with uh, heavy rain expected along the west and south coast. Northern Peninsula looks like and well essentially the Straits is where we'll see most of that snow. We already have a number of warnings in place. Wind warnings along the west coast, rainfall warnings for the south coast, rainfall uh, upwards of about 30 to 50 millimeters by the time Sunday morning rolls around. I'll have all those details in your full weekend forecast when I come back. Anthony. Thank you, Ashley. There's been a shakeup in the top management ranks at Nalcor Energy. John McIsaac, the senior official in charge of getting Muskrat Falls power from Labrador to Newfoundland, has left the Crown Corporation. McIsaac had been with Nalcor for eight years. He also was given responsibility for the integration of Muskrat Falls into the current electricity system. And in a news release today, Nalcor's CEO, Stan Marshall, thanked McIsaac for his service and wished him all the best in his future endeavors. But the release did not quote McIsaac himself. The Premier says he doesn't know if McIsaac was fired or not. These are details that I would leave to the, uh, to the management, the human resources team at Nalcor to actually expand on that as they see wishes. You know, this is not something that we are involved in at all, myself or the minister. These are decisions that are made at Nalcor. 
And McIsaac leaves now core as the public inquiry into Muskrat Falls resumes on Monday. One of the first items on the agenda for this next phase is the forensic audit of the costs incurred by Nalcor since the Muskrat Falls hydro project was sanctioned more than six years ago. Here now is Terry Roberts reports. It's the question that everyone is waiting to have answered. Why did all in costs for Muskrat balloon from 7.4 billion in 2012 to just under 13 billion today? An investigative audit by the accounting firm Grant Thornton will have the answers and it will be released on Monday when public hearings resume in Happy Valley Goose Bay. The province's consumer advocate has seen a confidential copy of the audit and says it's an eye opener. I believe uh, people uh, should uh, uh, will be concerned uh, when, they, uh, when they hear where their money went and where they hear uh, how frivolously their money was spent. One of the earliest and most vocal critics of Muskrat Falls wants answers to questions like this. Was the project properly managed? Were the contracts well ex executed? Uh, were there incentives for performance uh, in the contracts? were the, the bidders, the right people. The inquiry will call a wide array of witnesses over the next four months. Politicians, NALCOR officials, indigenous leaders, and various experts. And for the first time, we'll hear from the workers who are building the project. Based on evidence from the first phase last fall, Brown is expecting more damaging information to be released. There was no government oversight established when the money was given to NALCOR. The first roughly seven billion dollars. Uh, they weren't told that that was it. That's all we have. It's like they had a blank check. These politicians who awarded them public cash without putting any oversight in place, uh, they are accountable. The fundamental problems we had with this project was uh, were caused by uh, overconfidence. Overconfidence uh, in our ability to do things uh, overconfidence in our projections, particularly overconfidence in our cost projections. The inquiry will return to St. John's March 4th. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. To federal politics now, the Prime Minister faced more questions today about SNC-Lavalin and the resignation of Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould. She left Cabinet after reports that she pressured to make a deal to help SNC avoid a criminal trial. Justin Trudeau confirmed that his government was being lobbied by former and current Quebec premiers, the company itself, among others. But he offered a new twist on who raised the question about prosecution options. There are many discussions going on, which is why uh, uh, Jody uh, uh, Wilson-Raybould asked me uh, if, uh, if I was directing her or going to direct her to take a particular decision and I of course said no, uh, that it was her decision to make and I expected her to make it. Now, Trudeau says he accepts Wilson Rabel's decision to step down even though he doesn't understand it. He also strongly condemned what he called racist and sexist statements about Wilson Rabel that anonymous sources have made in the media. To the United States now where Donald Trump is delivering on a threat he's been making for weeks and he's doing it to follow through on a campaign pledge to build a wall during the U along the U.S. Mexican border. We're going to be signing today and registering national emergency and it's a great thing to do because we have an invasion of drugs, invasion of gangs, invasion of people, and it's unacceptable. Up to $8 billion will be available for construction. Nearly $1.4 billion comes from a funding bill to avert a second partial government shutdown. Another $600 million will come from drug forfeitures and other proceeds of crime. But most will be taken from the Pentagon. $2.5 billion from military anti-drug activities and another $3.5 billion from defense construction. Democrats and even some Republicans are critical of Trump's declaration. Well, Gonzaga High School in St. John's held its 37th annual Ocean Ranger prayer service today. It's a memorial that's organized every year to remember the 84 men who died when the drilling rig went down in a fierce storm on this date 
in 1982. As part of the ceremony, a candle is lit for each crew member that was lost. Adrian Cavanaugh of Fairyland narrowly missed being on board the Ocean Ranger that day. At the ceremony today, he spoke about the importance of continuing to remember the tragedy. Wayne Drake, Peter Fogg, Robert Allen. I worked with the uh, Slumberger at the time, and uh, there was three of us on a crew, and we were assigned to the Ocean Ranger when she came here to uh, work in the, off the Grand Banks. Yeah, I was uh, supposed to go out the week before that. I was uh, I took a, a week off because uh, at that time my father-in-law was pretty sick and. Uh, I took the week's holidays that I had uh, banked up, and uh, I uh, I stayed off. And uh, there was a there was a guy went uh, in the shop to working with me, and they sent him out in my place. He was uh, the last guy to get off the rig on a Saturday night. The last helicopter left. He was on it. He had a panel box fire in his house in town, and he said that uh, you know if uh, if you want to go in and see that everything is all right, you can go on in because Adrian will be out uh, Monday morning. I was on my way to the heliport Monday morning when uh, I listened to the news and they said about the the Ocean Ranger was you know was in trouble and and uh, we figured then at the time then that they'd be taking the people to the lifeboats and stuff like that but it was only when we got to the heliport that we see the actual uh, you know the significance of what was taking place. It happened so fast that they, they never had a chance, you know, and uh, this, this just kept going over and over in your mind all the time. And, it, uh, and uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of, you know, nights waking up with a cold sweat and, because you knew exactly what happened, you know. You, uh, you know, being there each two weeks at a time, you knew exactly where your room was, you knew exactly where everything was, and you could picture what happened and then, uh, you know, and, and just keep thinking about that all the time for the longest time after. Kept thinking about the, thinking about what happened then. And now I was sorry I felt for uh, all those involved. It all started and ended with Shane Earl. Just ahead, we look back at a dark chapter in our history. 30 years since Mount Cashel, a scandal that shattered the province and rocked the foundations of the Catholic Church.
Welcome back. The Cornerbrook Winter Carnival starts tonight. The West Coast City has been celebrating its white capped mountains and piles of snow for years with this 10 day event. It's one of the biggest winter carnivals in Atlantic Canada. Here now's Colleen Connors is live tonight where things are getting going as you can see Colleen. Hi there. Yes, we're at the beginning of the Winter Carnival in Cornerbrook. This is the ceremony where they lift up the flag for the carnival, light the torch. That's this big metal thing here to, on my right. And this is really where it begins. The 10 days of events that happen for the carnival in Cornerbrook. And I'm talking concerts, snow sculptures, a lot of eating, a lot of dancing, and that's really what this festival is all about. It takes a lot of people to get something like this going. There's a whole carnival committee that works year round to make this a, a huge festival and a huge carnival for the town of Cornerbrook. Right now behind me, the Atlantic Boys Choir just performed. They're introducing all of the dignitaries and really getting this whole thing going. But there's two people that I know were super excited to be a part of this festival. I'm talking about the youth ambassadors. This is Jenna and hey. Logan. And Logan. Hey, yeah. Now this is the youth ambassadors that we're talking about tonight. As you can see, their beautiful yes. sashes. <laughs> Thank you. They look so good. Thank they compete so with a lot of other youth in this community to be the ambassadors for the carnival. I know back in the day I also competed in the <laughs> ambassador contest and it's a lot of fun so I want to ask you guys tonight you know what are you most looking forward to when it comes to 10 days of this festival <laughs> we are honestly looking forward to everything we are so ready we got our jackets Tuesday we've been waiting like for two days like you know it doesn't sound like a lot but like I promise you like it's been like it felt like so long but like now that it's like Friday like we're so ready to get this show on the road and I we're so excited yeah so what is it that makes it so exciting for you it's everything about it it's the one time we get to enjoy winter around here because it's so rough you know our weather you can't see it half the time so to get out and enjoy the community and everybody I just can't wait. Oh, yeah. Now, I know there's a lot of dances and eating that goes on during this oh, winter yeah. carnival. So I wonder now, are you guys ready for all the dancing? Are you are you ready to hit the uh, the Legion and all the oh, other clubs? We wait. are so ready. We're, you'll see us out there. Like, yeah. so. Unfortunately for you, I can't dance to save my life, but I'll still do it. We'll have fun. Yeah, we're going to have so much fun. Must have been a stiff competition to oh. get these positions. Oh, my yeah. God, yeah. It was all our friends. We love everybody. Like <laughs> we had no idea who was gonna win. No, it was amazing. It was like very hard to like tell who was gonna win, and like we was with all of our friends. Like we were just like having oh, so much fun. That's right? so awesome. I think you guys are gonna have a wonderful oh, week. Yeah. <laughs> so later tonight is the opening ceremonies at Margaret Bowwater Park, where these guys definitely will be with all the carnival crew. And of course, there's even more events, especially the chili cook-off tomorrow here oh, in yeah. Cornerbrook. <laughs> Lots to come. So live in Cornerbrook tonight, I'm Colleen Connors for here and now. This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. <laughs> so let's get on a plane and head to Cornerbrook. Yeah, they were such great ambassadors. Oh, Talk sure. about enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Makes you yeah. want to go. Yeah. A lot of fun <laughs> Friday night in Cornerbrook. Have a great time at the Cornerbrook Festival. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And before we get to the weather, we have a video to show you from Northwest River. Just have a look at this. Ooh, this video was shared by Thea Panashaway. Yeah, and Pearl Montague took it, but watch that. Now a lot of snow. Yeah. And that's her husband, Mike. And then she has to get a chair out, as you'll see right here. <laughs> it's a bit out of that uh, Mutter I'm Stuck series. I'm, I'm assuming you've seen that, Ashley. I have you seen, that, seen one. that one. That was I, th from I, think, years I think this is the climactic moment. Okay. Yeah. Just uh, head down to the store and get some milk, would you? Or just dig yourself and out. <laughs> oh, yeah. no. to clean it's up not, there. Yeah, I think it's not over either. It's <laughs> needs a bigger chair. I think I would be needs laughing. A ladder. There he goes. Everything's fine. On his way. Carefully. He doesn't even have a shovel, does he? I think he's going to get it. <laughs> oh. This is the whole, I don't understand Where is the shovel? why the shovel, <laughs> well, he did it. Yeah. Always just get the door. I he don't understand why the shovels aren't inside. Is that what you do? Yes. 
And I've only been here makes for four sense. months. Yeah, it makes sense, because you get out. That's right. Yeah. You should have tied a rope to the doorknob so when he was back there, he could have pulled it shut instead of asking his <laughs> wife, hey, you get the door. <laughs> well, she didn't, she was just filming him, yeah. so. Great that is good okay. advice to keep your shovel inside. I keep my shovel outside. Yeah. But. I, especially, I mean, not all, you don't have to all the time, just mm -hmm. if you know there's a storm coming, yeah. maybe bring it inside. Mm -hmm. Good planning. Yeah. Sound advice. This makes sense. <laughs> So it's Friday. It is Friday. Thankfully, how, how is everything looking? Yeah, and I'm sure everybody really wants to know what the weather is going to be like, especially on the West Coast uh, for that. But, um, you know, the winds today, earlier today, were quite strong along the Northeast Coast. That wasn't uh, what we expected, but didn't quite reach that warning criteria. Only saw a gust near 70 kilometers per hour for St. John's uh, Bonavista around 93 kilometers per hour, but those temperatures have dropped uh, a couple of degrees from what we saw earlier today. We'll see them drop a couple more degrees as we head through the night tonight and then temperatures will start to increase and that's because our next system's moving in and that's bringing in warm air with it. So uh, we're already seeing that cloud cover move in on the satellite and radar. And uh, through the night, by the morning hours, we will start to see some snow along the west coast. Those winds are going to pick up as well. So right now they're quite light. We're going to see everything change over to southeast winds, 20 to 40, 60 kilometer per hour winds in exposed areas. Generally, uh, with that flurry activity moving towards Grand Falls, Windsor as well, minus 10. Otherwise, clearing or generally clear skies and light winds for most of uh, the eastern portion of the island. Up through St. Anthony, minus 16 and clear skies, and then up through Labrador. Labrador. As I mentioned, we're going to start to see some snow move in tonight, heading towards Happy Valley Goose Bay as well by morning. Some southeast winds near about 20 kilometers per hour through the night tonight. So we do have a couple of warnings uh, out ahead of this system. Those wind warnings along the west coast. Uh, going to see those gusts upwards of about 110 kilometers per hour tomorrow with rainfall warnings for included uh, Port of Basque all the way through to Ramia. I wouldn't be surprised if we see it for the Conagra Peninsula as well. And then a winter storm warning for the Straits. So here's a look at what we're expecting as far as the future tracker showing us. So snow moving in for Labrador and then quickly changing over to rain for the south and west coast tomorrow afternoon and heavy at times through the day, hence that rainfall warning. Now uh, the northern peninsula is a little bit of a tricky forecast. If we see that change over to rain, this becomes less of a 10 or 5 or 10 to 15 centimeter to more of a 25 to 35 centimeter forecast. So I have that just for the tip there. Otherwise, we're looking at about uh, 10 to 15 centimeters of snow. Trace to five centimeters likely in behind the rain for the west coast, the interior, and then about 10 to 20 millimeters expected rain for the south coast between 30 to 50 millimeters, hence that rainfall warning. Rain uh, otherwise for the Avalon. That will fall Saturday night into Sunday morning. So here's a quick look at your forecast. Generally uh, sitting around zero degrees. Things will warm up though as we head towards the overnight hours. And then uh, Grand Falls, Windsor, Harbor Breton all sitting above zero tomorrow morning. Same for the West Coast. You can see those uh, strong winds upwards of 110 kilometers per hour. Temperatures uh, around three degrees. And then the Northern Peninsula, strong winds. So blowing snow will certainly be a factor tomorrow afternoon. And then we're just looking at snow up through Labrador. But those temperatures quite nice in the minus single digits. So that's a look at your forecast for tomorrow. I'll have the details on the rest of your weekend when I come back. Well, today marks an important anniversary. 30 years ago today, the sex abuse scandal at the Mount Cashel Orphanage erupted. It was on this day in 1989, stories emerged about rumors of boys being sexually assaulted by the Irish Christian brothers and of a 1975 police investigation that officials covered up. And next week, we'll talk to a Mount Cashel victim and others connected with the scandal. But tonight, on the anniversary of the scandal breaking, we went into our archives to bring you this look back. Now, here's an excerpt from three decades ago by former CBC journalist Deanne Fleet and a warning. Even so many years later, some of this reporting may disturb you. All that remains of Mount Cashel is this empty field. The orphanage was demolished a few years ago, but its legacy of scandal continued. Now, the Irish Christian Brothers and Newfoundland government have finally admitted legal responsibility for the abuse that happened here. Many of the victims say it marks the beginning of the end. It all started and ended with Shane Earle. 
In 1989, CBC broadcast this report about sexual abuse by clergy. Involving alleged child sexual abuse here at Mount Cashel Orphanage in St. John's. According to Pike, that investigation was quashed. Shane Earle saw that report. Earl was seven years old when he was placed at Mount Cashel, the orphanage run by the Irish Christian Brothers. After watching the television report, Earl went directly to police. He gave them a horrific account of widespread sexual and physical abuse at Mount Cashel. When police seemed to be moving slowly, Earl feared they were covering the matter up, just as they had in 1975. Earl went to the media. One of the brothers uh, sexually assaulted me uh, very violently. That's my worst uh, remembrance. Earl also told his story to the Catholic Church group looking into abuse by its members. Shortly after, government set up its own inquiry, the Hughes Inquiry, and Shane Earl took his story there too. And then he had me open my legs wide. By this time, dozens of other boys from Mount Cashel were backing Earl up. Many were struck by the courage of these young men to talk openly about their abuse. Later, experts would say their televised testimony even prompted thousands of others across Canada to reveal their abuse as well. But not everyone at the Hughes Commission was as candid. Brother did inform us that he would investigate the matter and get back to us. I have no memory of anything else. He told me to transfer the two brothers from communities in Newfoundland to elsewhere within the Canadian province. I don't remember at any time talking to Helio personally. I, didn't, I wouldn't go over this assistant chief who was doing, who was heading up this and who was responsible for the operations of the CID. In the end, Judge Samuel Hughes found that the Chief of Police and the Deputy Minister of Justice covered up what happened at Mount Cashel because they wanted to protect the Roman Catholic Church. He said the Irish Christian Brothers were in on that cover-up. But many questions about the role of others in the scandal were left unanswered. Well, we'll bring you uh, more coverage next week related to the Mount Cashel scandal. And our coverage includes a documentary with some of the people at the very center of this story who share their thoughts and perspectives 30 years later.
Welcome back. Well, the CBS Fire Department is giving some old equipment a new life in a new community. The department recently bought some new gear and decided to donate the old gear to the Riverhead Fire Department. It's not the first time. Last year, CBS made a similar donation to the St. Shots Fire Department. As Mayor Terry French told me today, those communities were so grateful to CBS they wanted to return the favor with food. It's still very good equipment, it still works, of course you have to do your regular maintenance and checks on it, so we had upgraded in some areas, so it was only right that we should, uh, instead of throwing it in the garbage, if you will, we give it to uh, our friends and who are doing the same thing we're doing. Uh, you know, uh, respond, first responders who are trying to save lives and do what they can for, for the residents they, they look after. So this will give them a larger air supply, uh, at the very least, to go with what they already have there. So I mean, there's 14... Uh, 14 cylinders, I think it was, that we donated. Mm -hmm. uh, that will give them approximately, you know, seven hours working time of, of air without having to go and recharge, mm -hmm. recharge your cylinders. And of course they use them for training as well because you have to train for the, that, that type of thing. And I know the, the chief from Riverhead explained that they have their own training facility. So these, most of these tanks, I think, they're going to be used on a regular basis just for training. Mm -hmm. So all of this is, you know, certainly a big part of, of giving back if you can. And, you know, it's all about regional cooperation. And, you know, I think there's, there's got to be a way down life's road for us all to communicate and, and help each other. Uh, you know, I look at the towns that we're surrounded by, Paradise, Mount Pearl, St. John's, Holyrood. I mean, we work together now. Just recently, we lent our Zamboni to Paradise, for example. Uh, we partnered with Holyrood recently on a senior sphere. So all these things we can do. And I think we've got to reach out, you know, and probably start doing more of this stuff, whether that's planning our highways or planning our other services, recreational facilities. Because, you know, the day is coming. There's, there's only about 200,000 of us, I guess, or 250,000 in this end of the island. So I think regional cooperation is, is very, very important. And, you know, we can do it without using, losing our own identities. We're all paying taxes and we're all paying into the one pot. And these are little things that we can do as municipalities. But we don't need the province's checkbook behind us, and, and so we should. How can you encourage more regional cooperation, do you think? Well, we've started a dialogue now. It, it hasn't been, a, I guess, an official dialogue, but we've met now a couple of times I have with regional mayors and at different events, and we talk about it quite a bit because we, we get coming to a time now where, you know, our tax bases are what they are. People are paying extremely high taxes in all our towns, and we all try to find ways of reducing it. So, you know, as mayors and as councils, we've got to work together now and come up with plans. And it must feel pretty good to be helping out your fellow firefighters in Riverhead. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, we're pretty fortunate here in CBS. We're, we're a larger department. You know, we do have the support of council and the town, and our budget is, is fairly large as compared to many of the other smaller municipalities around. Uh, so for us to be able to give this, give this back, I mean, we didn't always have all this. It, we weren't always in the position that we're in now. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like I say, for us to be able to help smaller departments, yeah, it makes us feel good, I have to say. How much is the equipment worth? Well, I think these tanks are about $950 each to buy. So we gave them 14 tanks. So, you know, for a small volunteer organization, a $14,000 bill is a big bill. So now these are used, of course, so obviously they wouldn't be as valuable as brand new equipment. But for us, it was about giving. And, uh, you know, they were, of course, being in true Newfoundland fashion, they wanted to give us something for it. So in the case of Riverhead and St. Shots, we said, look, don't give us anything, give something to the local food bank. So between the two departments, they've now uh, donated $1,500 to our local food bank here in this area. So and we're more than appreciative of that. So this is a real example of paying it forward? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, we're all, you know, we're all living in Newfoundland and Labrador, and we all love the place, and, and why shouldn't we step up for each other when we can? And as you heard, Riverhead and St. Chots made a joint $1,500 donation to the CBS Food Bank. And here's what Riverhead Mayor Sheila Lee has to say about receiving the life-saving equipment. I think it's the wave of the future. I mean, there's not much point in having a fire truck and some equipment not near enough and not proper training. I mean, you're just not then prepared when a real emergency arises. And it's critical if people to know in our community, I mean, we reach out to a whole region. It's critical for people in their homes to know when they go to bed in the nighttime. I don't have to worry. Our fire department can handle this. We can't do this on our own. We can only do it with partnerships right now. Government has a lot of demands on money from our kinds of fire departments looking for stuff. But this $8,000 value of these things are just incredible for us.
I mean, it was so good, it was so generous of CBS Fire Department to do this. This don't happen very often. And we wanted to do something in a small way, even though we haven't got much money, to, to show gratitude. And of course, as we know, these past couple of weeks, the Food Sharing Association with their big fire, I mean, it was desperate. And it's wonderful to know that CBS has a food bank. I mean, God love them. It's one of the most vital uh, services you can offer to your residents. So we, we, want to, we wanted to help to show, uh, show, say thank you in a special way. It is literally like playing Russian roulette with your children. Thousands of students across the UK walked out of school today over climate change. We go to London's Parliament Square just ahead. Said across the pond now are thousands of students in Britain traded classes for mass demonstrations today. They spoke out in one voice calling for action against climate change. CBC's Kayla Hounslet was in the midst of one of those protests in London. Is what has become known as the youth strike for climate. Thousands of students from right across the UK are walking out of class today. There are hundreds, maybe more, here in London's Parliament Square, and they're calling for action, government action, on climate change. This all started last year when a young girl from Sweden, just 15 years old, protested alone outside Sweden's parliament. Since then, her speeches at international summits have been taking off, they've gone viral. Her message really striking a chord. And here today, there are some very young children, school-age children, as well as college and university students. We had a chance to speak with a 13-year-old boy who's pretty passionate about this issue. I'm passionate about it because I'm worried about my future, because I've done research and it's clear that if we don't do something about it now, the futures of all the children in the world are going to be at risk. It is literally like playing Russian roulette with your children. And specifically, the students are calling for the government to call a climate state of emergency. They're also calling for reforms to the curriculum so that climate change can become an educational priority. And they want the voting age to be lowered from 18 down to 16 so that youth voices can be a part of policy making. And they're warning that this demonstration here today is just the beginning of what will be escalating action. They're planning a global day of action for March 15th. Kayla Hounsell, CBC News, London.
Okay, weekend's here. Yes. Um, what are we going to look at? I see. Uh, we're looking at Sunday's forecast now. All right, the end of looking the weekend. Looking ahead, yeah. Okay. Uh, the beginning of the day on Sunday doesn't actually uh, look too bad. And then eventually everything will clear up. So if we take a look, yes. Yeah, so if we take a look at uh, the overnight, is when things will be messy. We'll see that rain head towards the Avalon after midnight, and then in behind that, it looks like skies should generally clear out. We might see a few cloudy periods though into the afternoon, with the chance of a few flurries along the west coast up through Labrador. Uh, we're going to hang on to that, some of that cloud cover as well. More so a mix of sun and cloud, and then that chance of flurries through the afternoon. But the temperatures are going to drop right uh, into the afternoon. So a morning high. These are your morning high temperatures between uh, zero and four degrees for Grand Falls, Windsor towards uh, the Avalon. And then into the afternoon, we'll see that colder air move in and the temperatures will plummet. So along the west coast, uh, we're sitting around minus four for Cornerbrook, two degrees for Port of Basque. Plenty of sunshine, it looks like, but then again, that potential for some lingering flurries along uh, the west, the rest of the west coast. Otherwise, up through Labrador, a mix of sun and cloud, minus 17 for Lab City with that chance of flurries, minus six for Nain and same for Cartwright, and it looks like it should just be a mix of sun and cloud through the day. Now, heading into next week, things are going to get cold and stay cold right into the first half of next week as we see the uh, another round of the polar vortex essentially move in and uh, stick around right through Thursday. Now, uh, as far as weather goes into Sunday overnight into Monday, we could see that potential for some snow squalls along the west coast. A little system, or a lot, rather a large system, off the coast of Labrador could bring some snow as well for coastal Labrador. Through Monday uh, into Tuesday, things will clear out. But again, still looking at that potential for some squalls along the west coast. So I certainly have those in the forecast, and that's the story right through Wednesday. Otherwise, it looks quiet uh, for the rest of the province. So here's a look at your forecast for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. Uh, snow or a few flurries tomorrow afternoon changing over to rain in the evening as that temperature climbs to two degrees, four by Sunday and then dropping to about minus eight overnight on Sunday. And then we're gonna stay windy through Tuesday and Wednesday. Again, I have that potential for a few flurries in there. Uh, Central Newfoundland, other than tomorrow, the rest of the into beginning of next week looks absolutely beautiful with a mix of sun and cloud. Those temperatures dropping down to about minus 11 by Wednesday. And then Western Newfoundland hanging on to that potential for some squalls Monday and Tuesday. And then up through Labrador, uh, Eastern Labrador, we're looking at 10 to 15 centimeters tomorrow and then flurries through the rest of the week. And then for Western Labrador, same thing, about five to 10 centimeters though. And then uh, flurries both Sunday and Monday. So just before uh, I leave right now, we're gonna look at the weather photo for the day. This is your shot. It is taken on the West Coast somewhere. What a gorgeous shot. Yeah, someone's wow. enjoying that. Any idea where that's taken? Uh, winter heaven. That's yeah. fabulous. <laughs> exactly. What it looks like. Look, complete virgin snow for somebody on a machine like that. What a field day. Yeah, absolutely beautiful. Now oh. you had a question. Oh, uh, I do. Where is it? Yeah, where is it? <laughs> I, uh, no idea. Yeah. That's okay. I'll tell you where this was when I come back. Okay. Well. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Well, people going to the Canadian International Auto Show in Toronto this weekend, well, they expect to see sleek, sexy, and somewhat exotic vehicles. Yes, but they have never seen anything like this. Go Transit, that's the system that serves the greater Toronto area, released this tongue-in-cheek video. Yeah, it's shot like a luxury car ad. It aims to make riding the bus look almost glamorous. Now, the, the real bus is going to go on display alongside all the Lamborghinis and the Lotuses, and auto fans will even get a chance to take a look under the hood. That's a good idea. It's Not well bad. done, yeah.
Well, it's Friday. Time to see who's celebrating. Jake Windsor, formerly of Wesleyville, now residing in Mount Pearl, will celebrate his 98th birthday this Sunday. Happy 91st birthday to George Kendall of Corner Brook, who celebrated on Monday. On Tuesday, it was a happy 91st birthday for Myrtle Rice, originally from Bay Vert. Myrtle is now in Lewisport. Happy 99th birthday to Molly Young in Corner Brook. Happy 63rd wedding anniversary to Norman and Erla Butt from Swift Current. Congratulations to Reverend John and Dallas Adams in St. John's who celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary yesterday on Valentine's Day. They now live in St. John's. And a happy 50th wedding anniversary to Richard and Linda Ryle in Bryant's Cove. Elizabeth Howell in Northern Bay turned 90 on February 5th, and that was 10 days ago. Apologies, Elizabeth, we somehow missed that. Hope it was a great day. And Elizabeth lives on her own in Northern Bay and does, we're told, pretty much everything for herself and what she wants to do. A happy 99th birthday to Dorothy Michelin in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Frank Gorman celebrates his 92nd birthday tomorrow. He is formerly of Mall Bay and now is in Kelly Groups. Happy 51st anniversary to Hubert and Dorothy Butt from Lance Claire. And a happy 94th birthday to Ross Pritchett in Gambo. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Marie and Tom Harvey from Fairyland. Their big day was last Friday on the 8th. And it was a 66th wedding anniversary for Albert and Marie Burton in Springdale. They celebrated on Tuesday. Happy 54th wedding anniversary to Austin and Lorraine Lowe in St. John's. Their big day was on Wednesday. Eugene and Bessie Lush from Torbay will celebrate their 52nd wedding anniversary this Sunday. And also on Sunday, Bruce and Joan Snook and Fortune will be celebrating 52 years of marriage. Special greetings from your grandson, Dylan, in Alberta. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to John and Helen Cantwell living in Torbay. And happy 61st anniversary to Clyde and Muriel Drover in Bishop's Cove. Happy 61st anniversary to Reg and Elsie Party in Happy Valley Goose Bay. They celebrated on Wednesday. And happy 50th anniversary greetings to Dave and Betty Thistle in Spaniards Bay. Congratulations tomorrow on their 66th wedding anniversary to Violet and Onias Ralph in Grand Falls, Windsor, formerly from Flat Island Bonavista Bay. They celebrate tomorrow. And a happy 61st anniversary today for Winifield and Lillian Higgins. And it's a big 65th anniversary to Ruby and Charles Hines from Sop's Arm with love from children, grandchildren, and of course, great-grandchildren. Happy 59th anniversary to Joseph and Carmel Hatch from Redhead Cove, now living in Old Perlican. Their big day is on the 20th. Well, there's your weather photo from so earlier. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. No idea where that is taken, hey? No clue. Labrador. West Coast. Oh, there we Gross go. Gross morn. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. Flat part. Yeah. <laughs> when I saw that photo, it just took uh, took my breath away. Definitely enjoying it. Sean Parsons sent us that photo. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very no. much, Sean. That'd be a nice screensaver on your computer. It would. It? it would be. Yeah. Absolutely. Send me that, Sean. I've been looking for a replacement. <laughs> Hope you have a great weekend. Find something nice to do outdoors like uh, Sean can do there. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you on Monday. Yeah. Have a great weekend. Good night. Good night. Bye now.